13 folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country, service to people, protecting God-given rights, preserving freedoms. 13 folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind, the mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. Thirteen folds. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So, draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known. Let this church be a safe place, a comforting place. And let us honor those who have given their lives in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen. And you know, every week on Sunday, we get to celebrate the fact that God had chose to love us, sent his son for us, so he chose to give his life for us, and to remember that we get to worship and have freedom and live with hope because of what Jesus did for us. But as a nation, as a country, we also get to experience that because of men and women who chose to stand in the gap for us, who gave their lives, and Memorial Day tomorrow is a day when we just honor them. So can we stop and just pray a prayer of thankfulness for the families who have sacrificed so much so that we could experience freedom? Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for today and the chance just to be in this moment and to understand, Father, that the hope that we live every day is because of your love and grace and mercy, because of your willingness to send your son and his willingness to stand in a gap, to bridge a gap for us that we could never bridge on our own to grant us forgiveness and grace and mercy, Father, so that we live every day with the hope of eternity. And yet, Father, here on earth, we as a community, as a nation, get to experience the freedom to worship, to disagree, to love, to engage, to push one another, Father. We get to experience that. We have the freedom of that because of men and women who have also chosen to stand in the gap who have given their lives so that we could experience the freedom that we have today. And today, Father, I just pray for those families who, Father, have experienced loss, that they would understand, Father, that the gratefulness that we have for that sacrifice, that you would bless those families, Father, and they would feel your presence in a way that maybe they never have. God, thank you that they're, thank you for the courage of men and women to fight, not just for you, but for us, for me. Thank you that we're able to honor him this way. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for having me and let me be here and thank you guys for being here wherever uh, you're joining us from. Uh, it's an interesting thing to be uh, right here, but we have been in this book of First Peter and uh, you know what you do when technology doesn't work? You repeat the thing you just said, and you make your way back to your notes. So you repeat the thing you just said, and you make your way back to your notes. <laughs> and then miraculously, it works. It's amazing. If you've been reading with us for a while, you've learned in 1 Peter, this book in the New Testament, it was written to a bunch of people who were Christians, followers of Jesus, who were living in exile. Peter has written this letter to followers of Jesus who are trying to live out their faith under severe persecution. And this is all taking place during the time of Nero, who was a violent man and who took persecution to new levels and extremes. Nero actually burned the city of Rome 
And historians say that he sang for uh, the entire time that it burned, and it burned for nine days. Now, what he wanted is to burn the city and then build it back better and bigger than it was before. But the people, if you can imagine, didn't really like this strategy, and so they began to rebel against him, and Nero needed someone to blame, and so he blamed the Christians. And so began an incredibly violent season of persecution against Christians in Rome. Eventually, Peter, who wrote this letter that we're studying, would be crucified upside down under Nero's persecution. And it's into this world, it's into this kind of culture that Peter writes this letter to followers of Jesus to try to help them understand what they are to do, how they are to respond, how they live in a time of increasing opposition and hostility. If you've been reading with us, you know that Peter begins this letter by reminding them, here's who you are. Uh, this, This thing you're going through, I don't want you to be discouraged by what you're experiencing in this world because this world, it's not your home. You're not citizens of earth. You're citizens of heaven. And because this is who you are, because this is your identity, then there are some implications to that truth. And what was true for them then is true for every follower of Jesus today. This world, it's not your home. And if you're a believer, you have hope beyond this world. Because right here, you're a foreigner, you're a stranger, you're an alien, you're an exile. And if that is your identity, and if it's my identity, if it's our identity, there are some implications to how you and I should live in this world right now. But if you're like me, you probably think, well, you know, my, our circumstances aren't really the same. They don't really compare to the things the Christians in the first century were going through. But I actually think now is a great time to ask questions. Like, how are you going to respond when what you believe or how you live isn't very popular? What do we do when we increasingly feel like we're in the minority or under attack? How do we live when it feels like the walls of our lives are caving in because of circumstances or choices we've made or trials or struggles. I think in chapter one, Peter reminds Christians in the first century of their identity, and he does it in order to fuel their perseverance. Because this world is not their home, it's not our home, that means that our circumstances, no matter how painful, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're struggling in, they are temporary. And we have discovered, as we've read, that Peter gives the motivation to live intentional, set-apart, holy lives, distinctive lives for God, even in the midst of the circumstances that you and I are going to live through. He says in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1 that Jesus is going to return, and you and I should live with a reverent fear and with the knowledge and a constant awareness that He is coming back, that Jesus is returning. In verses 18 and 19, he says that you and I have been ransomed. Our debt has been paid by the blood of Jesus. And because Jesus has paid that price, he has the right to tell them. And he has the right to tell you and me how you should live and what you should do. That's his right to do. Basically, he says, This is, if I were to sum up chapter one, basically he says this, what you do in life, how you live, flows from who you are. How you live in this world flows from your identity as a follower of Jesus and what he has done for you. And that means that you and I can live and experience real joy. We can live with joy, not because of the joy that's in the thing we're in, but because of the joy that's ahead. It means we can live lives that are distinguished from the rest of the world because of the way we love and we engage other people. And then in chapter two, 
of 1 Peter, he gets really specific. And he says, this is who you are. This is the way you've been called. You've been called to live separate lives. Let me get specific how you do that. You need to get rid of. He says, therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore, you know what you do, right? You ask why that's therefore. It's brilliant, I know. God's so lucky. He says, therefore, uh, because of who you are, because you've been called, because I've paid a price for you, because of what's waiting for you beyond this world, you need to leave it, live a distinctive life and rid yourselves. And I like the way the message paraphrases that part. It says, so clean your house. It carries the idea of cleaning out the junk drawer in your house, right, that everybody has. Only this one holds sin that he's going to talk about. So clean the junk drawer of your lives, get specific, rid yourselves of all malice. That's the desire to see pain in someone's life, to cause harm or get revenge or have bitterness or you're going to pay. And get rid of all deceit, he says. And this is the Greek word dolos. And it's the idea of making someone think that you're offering one thing, but you're actually giving them something else. It's like baiting a hook or manipulating for your gain. Maybe you've seen this happen in a relationship you've been in, or maybe you've done this in a relationship that you've been in. And so he says, get rid of that and get rid of hypocrisy. This means that you're playing a part. You're acting like you're something you're not. Maybe you're wearing a mask of right living while your life is lived in contradiction to that. He says, I also want you to get rid of envy, and everyone knows what envy is, right? We all know the danger of envy, that big, green, ugly monster that brings about anxiety and grief and bitterness into our lives over the success of somebody else. It's the constant wondering why them and not me. I mean, it's the emotion that never allows you to be content or satisfied with what you have or where you are, and it destroys people and relationships. And then he ends with this, and you also need to get rid of slander of every kind. And it's interesting that he ends with that. It's the Greek word katalalia, and it simply means backbiting or speaking evil. And it's, it's not a coincidence that slander is at the end of this, right? When we talk about things like malice, deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, because all of those things result in slander. And Peter says that part of holy living, part of the life that you and I have been called to, the lives, part of living a life set apart for God is getting rid of some of these things, of cleaning out our junk drawer, of cleaning out our house. And while he gives us this list, everybody look at me for a minute, all right, so that we all understand this. While he gives us this list, if your thing isn't on the list, it doesn't mean it didn't make the list. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of lists in the New Testament. You come up after, tell me what your is, and I'll tell you where it is, okay? Here's what it means. It's not meant to be an all-inclusive list or comprehensive. In other words, if you're thinking that your thing isn't on the list, it doesn't mean it's not included. In fact, if you're thinking of something that you're struggling with, which probably all of you are right now, something that you struggle in, something that you're hiding in the junk drawer of your life, it's on the list. And the question is not whether the sin is on the list. The question is, are you going to clean out the junk drawer of your life? What needs to be cleaned out so that you can live out your identity as a follower of Jesus in this world? So he says, rid yourselves, but he says something else. I want you to now crave. Look at verse two. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it, you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter says, here are some things that you need to get rid of. And in verse two, here are some things that you need to crave. You need to crave godliness so that you can mature and so that you can grow up and become who I want you to become. And here's why, because you've tasted it. That if you're a follower of Jesus, you've seen it. And once you've experienced it, it should create an appetite in your life. And here's the weird thing, right, that we'll talk about. The problem, and we'll talk, he'll talk about this later, is that all of us 
can recognize sin in our lives and recognize a need for something to get us out of that. The problem is once we receive it, we don't usually move on from it. And we just stay there. He says, listen, when you come into a relationship with God, when you've tasted him, when you've experienced him, it should create an appetite in you for godliness. I mean, if Peter were writing these things to people who were not Christians, people who hadn't seen God's goodness, people who'd not encountered the good news of the gospel, and think about that, right? I mean, these letters are two Christians, two followers of Jesus, two people who have surrendered their lives to him. And so let me say this, if that's you, you need to listen closely today. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you're here today and you don't believe in God. You're just visiting or maybe somebody dragged you here, right? And you're here not of your own volition, but you're just trying to appease someone. Can I just say thanks for being here? The reality of this letter, though, is while he says it's for Christians, this is for you. Because I promise you the thing that you've been looking for is found right here. And so thanks for being here and staying with us, and I hope you'll continue to do that. But if he had written this letter to you, to people who weren't following Jesus, and if he had told you, hey, this is how you live, it's not going to be really effective for you, right? You're not going to be really interested in something you're not following. But if you're a Christian who has been purchased by the blood of Jesus, who has tasted and seen the goodness of God, then it should create in you a desire for a godly life. And I'm going to expand on that, and I'm going to jump back to chapter 1, verse 23. I want you to go there, but listen, Peter tells us you can live distinctive lives. You can live a set-apart life. You can experience joy. You can love like I've loved you when your life and my life experiences a spiritual transformation. And here's what I mean by spiritual transformation. That happens when your life and my life begins to change every day as we become more and more like Jesus. Spiritual transformation is the process by which you and I become less and less like who we were, the person we were, and more and more like the person of Jesus. This is God's desire for your life. It's his desire for everyone. Why? Because when we experience tr spiritual transformation, we discover that we can live extraordinary lives, different lives, and we can do it no matter our circumstances. No matter what's happening around us, Peter's words for them then and for you and me today, for followers of Jesus, is this. You have the ability to live an extraordinary life because Jesus is alive in you. Look at what he says in chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not by perishable seed. Not by perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word of the Lord to you, right? This is the word that was preached to you. When you placed your trust in Jesus, there was a seed planted in you and in me, and it has all the energy necessary to form the image and character of Christ in us. And that's what God wants. That's what God's will is for your life and for my life, because that's how we are transformed. And when that happens, if that happens, you get hope. Because of what it brings into your life. You can live a different, you can live with a different perspective because of what he's doing in you. And you have hope because you can be free of worry. You can love people not the way you think they need to be loved or you think they deserve to be loved, but the way that he loved you. You won't be enslaved by destructive habits and your outward circumstances won't have an impact on your inward joy. And you'll also be able to see how incredible opposition in our life actually becomes incredible opportunity to live out our faith and show the difference Jesus makes. And it's possible because of the imperishable seed that was planted in you, God's word. And when that seed is allowed to grow, it becomes Christ in you. And that spiritual transformation, transformation. But listen to me, transformation is not going to happen in your life by gaining spiritual information. So sitting in here or listening to someone or watching someone is not the thing that's going to transform your life. 
The other thing is, look around and you see, hey, my life would look better if it looked like theirs. They look really good. Conforming your life to something is not going to result in spiritual transformation. Looking like people around you is not going to transform your life. Spiritual transformation cannot happen apart from a commitment to God's Word. And it is something that you play a role in. Listen, we don't, have, we don't just try to change or to, to, to change our behavior or to try to be better or to be more good, right? Try harder. God is not interested in you being better or gooder, all right? God is trying to create you into something that this world, something different than what this world wants for you. And God's process to transform you includes changing the inner you, where your desires and motivations are. I mean, I'm going to see if I can illustrate this with you, for you today. This is a picture of my wife, and uh, uh, I married a cover girl. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, yeah, she's, but I mean, we can agree, she got pretty lucky too. Right? They actually took a whole bunch of pictures of us uh, together right, out on the porch and, and in the same place. And I'm trying to figure out what, you know, what it means that we weren't a cover couple and <laughs> why I'm not on the cover with her, but whatever. <laughs> this is a picture. She, wanted her, she asked her, you know, what's your favorite thing to do? And Jolene loves to garden, so she took it in front of a plant. Jolene loves to garden. Uh, she loves to to be out and do flowers, to do, well, anything that grows, I guess, whatever that is. She loves to do it. She just loves to do it. Me, I mean, I like to walk outside to the cart, right? I mean, it's about as far as I'm going. But she can grow anything as well. And so she has these two flowers. Uh, this is a Cattleya, and this is called a Dahlia. And uh, so the, for the past two, past two weeks, every time I come in the door, she's asked me, hey, did you see my Cattleya? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it was beautiful. She said, did you see the Dahlia? Yep. <laughs> yep, right out there too. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty as well. You didn't see it. I said, sure I did, they're outside. I looked at them when I came in. I mean, I thought she's talking about, you know, Honestly, I didn't know what she was talking about because I didn't see him. I thought she was talking about an Apple operating system or Samson's girlfriend. <laughs> You're going to get that, some of you, in a minute. Dahlia and Delilah. <laughs> Told you. Listen, I, I had no idea. This is what this um, Cattleya looked like six years ago, which I did not know they could live that long, right? I didn't know. I thought we got new plants every year. And so... <laughs> But she's had it that long. She had it started in this thing, and this is what it looks like today. It takes up the entire front of our, our porch. It's just there. There's no way. Yes, I saw it. You can't miss it. If she said the plant that's sitting that's taking over the porch, I would have said, oh, yeah, I saw that one. I don't know what it's called, right? But she's worked with it. She's fed it. She's planted it. She's replanted it. She's nourished it. She's nurtured it. She's watched it get sick and then nurtured it back to health and given it more and it's gone through seasons of transformation and it, it's gotten bigger and bigger and stronger and more beautiful and healthier as it gone. It started out as a seed and when it was planted in fertile soil, it grew and blossomed and it bore fruit. This is the way it is with the word of God in your life. You just don't wanna take the time to get it there. It's the same way. God's word takes root in our hearts and it transforms us from within. And, that, and here's how I know it, because that transformation is reflected in the way you live and engage in this world. It can be seen in your life. Just as a seed contains life when it is planted in fertile soil, it grows and it blossoms and it makes that. Listen, the plant began as just this small seed and it's the same for you and me. Transformation does not happen because you want it to do, want it to or hope it happens or wish it would. It happens when God's word is planted in you. When you read it and reflect on it, when you hear it and you apply it and you allow it to change the inner, inner you where you're 
your motivations and desires and behaviors are. God's word, what Peter calls the imperishable seed, it never dies. He says the physical things that are around us, the things we pursue, that we put our confidence in, our achievements and possessions, our abilities and our appearance, those things, the things we often value and pursue in this world, they are temporary and subject to decay. And if you don't believe me, just look in the mirror. The Word of God stands as a foundation that is unchanging and reliable. It offers guidance and wisdom and hope that surpasses the temporal realities of this life. When you and me, when we anchor our lives on the unchanging truth of God's word, it changes us. It strengthens us in a world of shifting opinions, cultural trends, and moral relativity. We anchor our lives to God's word because it serves as a compass that guides us through the complexities and challenges that we will face in this world. It is the thing that points us towards hope in seasons of sorrow. It gives us courage when we are facing a trial, and it provides strength when you are at your weakest moment. By meditating on its truths and applying it to our lives, we allow it to shape our desires and our decisions and our actions and our choices. The Word of God, he says, stands forever. Forever. That's how it began in you. Because at some point in your life, and maybe this will happen for your life today, at some point in your life, someone shared the good news that God loves you and that he died for you and that he really desires real life for you. And that resulted in a hope that you live with today or a hope that you could live with today. So back to chapter two, Peter says you need to get rid of this and then he says you need to crave this as a child is dependent on their parent. We have to recognize the life that we are called to, that we are called to live is only possible through our willingness to depend on God and not ourselves. The spiritual nourishment that we receive through the word of God is the thing that does it. It strengthens our faith and deepens our understanding and equips us for every challenge in life. Because he has chosen us, because we are his, because we have had a personal encounter with Jesus, with his mercy and grace and forgiveness, it not only gives us strength to persevere while we're here, it deepens our understanding of what is waiting for us there in eternity. And it shapes the way we live and we engage in this world. But it doesn't end there. As important as God's word is in spiritual transformation, God's word is not the end because you and I don't worship the Bible. The Bible points us to Jesus. Look at verse four. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, that phrase, come to him, is pretty significant in the original language here because it communicates something that happens continuously, all right? It's always happening. This is a present participle in the original language, and it's active, which means this. Peter is implying that there is a continuous action of coming to Jesus. He's talking about an ongoing relationship and fellowship and communion with Jesus. You don't just come to Jesus one time for salvation, and then that's it. Although, again, that's the way we'd like it. Because if we could just get that insurance that we're going to be okay and then live like, like we want, or God would just get on board with our plan, it would be a lot easier for us, right? That's what we think. But that's not God's plan for your life. That's not how transformation works. Transformation happens as we come to Jesus over and over and over and over again. It's not that we come to him to be saved over and over again. That's something that happens once, but that's not the end of our relationship with him. It's the beginning. A.W. Tozer wrote, we are caught in the spurious or false logic of thinking that having found him, we no longer need to seek him. And that's not true. Our life is about seeking him over and over. Verse five, you also, like living stones, are being built 
into a spiritual house to be holy priest to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus for in scripture it says see I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame now to you who believe the stone is precious but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. The word stone in the Greek language is the word lithos, and it is a reference to a building stone. The image that Paul is presenting is one of a stone that was perfectly designed and shaped to become the cornerstone of the church. But in this specific case the cornerstone of your life because the church isn't a building. The church is you and me. It's us. It's a movement that began 2,000 years ago and continues today. The church is people. And in ancient days, a cornerstone was a stone at the corner of two walls that united them. It was the visible corner of the foundation and, and the starting point of everything that would be built above the foundation. It was the largest, most solid, most carefully uh, constructed and placed stone there was. And that's what Jesus is. He is the foundation that our lives and our faith is built on. And when you come to Jesus in faith, you become united with him. And eternal life is one of the results of that uniting. And so you become a living stone. But it's not the only thing. Peter says that when you come to the living stone, Jesus he builds you into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You know what that is? That is spiritual transformation in your life. It's what happens when you come to Christ and he builds you spiritually, but it's not it. As you come to Jesus, you are changed on the inside through the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. Just like everything Listen close, just like everything, whether you call yourself a follower of Jesus today or not, it's a choice. But I want you to understand something. Everyone in this room, all of you, you are all building your life on some foundation. Every one of you. Jesus himself said it's either going to be a rock, a cornerstone, or it's going to be sand. And it will be revealed as you move through life. It is a choice. You get to decide what will be the foundation of your life. And there are only two choices when it comes to Jesus. You either accept him and he becomes the cornerstone of your life that leads to real life here and behind, but beyond, or you reject him, and he becomes the cornerstone that you stumble over. There is no in-between. And Peter reminds them again of who they are, of who we are, that we are living stones because everything we do flows from who we are. Because of God's word, right? Right? Because of God's word and who he is, you're not the same anymore. You're different. You're distinct. Your life has been transformed. And it is not built on feelings. It is built on a relationship with Jesus. He then says this, because of who you are, that carries some responsibilities because every role comes with some responsibilities. Look at verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That closely you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter says, as chosen people, you and me, we are de to declare his praises. Even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of your brokenness and whatever you're going through, even when you can't see him, even when you can't feel him, even when you're wondering where he is, you declare his praises. Because of who you are and what God has done for us, we are to speak out for him, to declare his goodness. The message says this, 
to tell others the night and day difference that he has made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Now, talking like that, declaring God's goodness is a lot different than looking at somebody and saying, or writing on social media and saying, you're wrong, I'm right. This is about humility and vulnerability, about telling people, look, here's the difference that Jesus made in my life. God took me from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And here's how I've experienced his mercy in my life. This is the kind of attitude that has to mark followers of Jesus whose lives have been transformed by his word and the Holy Spirit in a culture that is antagonistic to our lives. We are humble and we are vulnerable and we speak about the difference that God has made in our lives, the difference he makes in our marriages, in our relationships, in our struggles, in our brokenness. We say to people, I used to be this way, but because God's love and God's work in me, Jesus has made me this way. Peter calls us out to live holy, which is set apart, different, distinct lives so that people will see a difference. So there better be a difference in your life. Because people are going to want to know what's making the difference. Look at how he ends. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war, wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. Again, the message paraphrases it this way. Friends, this, this world, it's not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life in your neighborhood so that your actions will refute their prejudices and then they will be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives because he's coming back. This world is not an easy place to live and this culture is not the easiest place to be a follower of Jesus in. I mean, obviously it wasn't for first century Christians in Rome and that's why Peter is writing this letter and every one of us is going to face trials. Trials in different ways, at different times, and in different severities. And you know what else? Sometimes it's embarrassing to be left out of the crowd, isn't it? Sometimes it's humbling to be stereotyped on social media or by people in our lives. And sometimes it's hard to be mocked for an unpopular belief. And there's probably those of you, in fact, I know there's those of you, that want to fight back because I've watched you do it on social media to get defensive because you think there's a lot at stake here. Everybody look at me. There is a lot at stake here. There's a whole lot more at stake than your pride. Eternity is at stake here. For people you know, and people you love, and people in your family, and people that you're connected to, and guess what? For people you don't love, and you don't like, eternity is at stake. I'm so thankful that somebody didn't think that way about me years and years ago. You know, I, I grew up in church. I went to church. I had a drug problem when I was young. My mom drug me to church every Sunday. <laughs> it's an old stupid joke. Later on in life, I did have a drug problem and all kinds of problems. And I ran from God as hard as I could because I didn't want anything to do with him. You know why? Because God failed me. That's what he did sang a song that says he never failed, but I guarantee you in that moment, I decided that God had failed me. And because he failed me, I just ran away. A few years later, I realized that God hadn't failed me. People failed me. And so I was looking for something, anything, anything that would give my life purpose and meaning. And I met a guy, his name was John, and he's a preacher at a tiny church of about 50 people in nowhere, Texas. It's amazing the people that God would use in your life. Who sat down with me and said, the thing that you've been running from and the thing that you've been looking for, it's the same thing. 
And here's this relationship that you can have. The hole that you're trying to fill, the life that you really want, the loneliness that you're experiencing, the things that you're trying to fill your life with, they won't bring you meaning and purpose. But this thing will. And so he sat down with me and prayed with me. And that night, that, my life changed forever. It didn't get better. He didn't fix everything. Still hasn't fixed everything. But my life isn't built on sand. My life is built on a relationship with Jesus. My faith is in him, not in this world. My hope rests beyond this world. And I can't imagine living life today without that foundation. And Peter says, that's the kind of people you should be. That's the kind of thing that matters. That's the way you need to live. Whatever you're facing, whatever crisis, whatever pain, loneliness, brokenness, sorrow, anger, fear, your life can be transformed. You can live a good life, a life built upon Jesus and his word. Through Christ, we have been remade and we have been transformed because of his mercy and grace. And we are called into a new way of living. We have been called out to be God's message in a broken and decaying world. You and I, we're exiles. And our lives should look different than the rest of the world. So live your life in such a way that when people who don't know Jesus see how you are living, it will refute their prejudices. And they will be won over to the one who can transform their life into something beautiful. Father, thank you for today and just the chance to be here in this moment and to be reminded of your grace, mercy, and love. To know, Father, that you are not a God who is far away, who just stepped into our life and then stepped out, but you're a God who wants so much more for us than we even want for ourselves. You have a desire and a life and an impact that you want for us. And I just pray that we would do that, Father. I pray that, I pray that we would be found faithful like those first century Christians. Men and women who are fighting, not back, but to be different and to show the world what different looks like, to show the world the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. And I pray today that if there's people who have never walked into a relationship with you, that today they would find the hope that can only come from that. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.